Hey, uh, also on the program today, co-hosting and doing the double duty of actually being a guest in the first segment as well, Delegate Michael Height. Mr. Height, good to see you. Good morning. It's great to be here. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Pleasure to have you both along for the ride at uh, 835. We are joined by Mike Carl, Larry Schultz, and by phone Joe Ferretti for the Friday Five, which uh, guarantees to, uh, at a minimum, stir interesting, <laughs> controversial discussion that uh, could leave you talking for uh, days and days after the show about, did you hear what he just said? It, yeah, if you can get over the shock, you're going to be so so <laughs> shocked, you'll be absolutely <laughs> stupefied, if that's your word, Mike. <laughs> so, uh, stupefied is a word. Yeah, 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 yeah. it is. Well, uh, unlike, I, I unlike, your, <laughs> unlike your inability to separate the words delegate and delegate. <laughs> yeah, that was part of the pre- <laughs> <laughs> free program going on air discussion. Yeah. We had a rich discussion, and I uh, I enjoyed Mike telling me, uh, 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 Mike Height telling me the side behind the story of him leaning, lending Mike Hornby some tools <laughs> and what he has to go through, the screening process that should have been involved. <laughs> Yeah, I had no idea he was going to... Um, Actually use them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Try to amputate his his uh, limbs. He got a lot of calls, he said, because we, we may have painted a picture that yeah. was a bit exaggerated in terms of what actually took place. But if we did, but, credit to us. Yeah, but he threw us under the bus very quickly, very easily. He did it naturally. He, did. he did. Well, and he did send us a picture right after it happened with the blood everywhere, yeah. you know. <laughs> and and then and then afterwards, you you get it all cleaned up, and you realize, uh, you know, a a Snoopy band aid would have taken yeah. care of the thing, possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, just to. A note to our audience members out there, on Monday you can help Meals on Wheels. If you go to, uh, uh, I, I think it's, is it, do I have the right here? Hold on. Rob's going is, is to spot. Is it Captain. Jersey Mike's? Yeah. Jersey Mike. Call, yep. I think, yep. I think yep. Jersey Mike's, yep. you go there for yep. lunch in the Commons, and 15% uh, of your lunch menu price will be uh, donated to Meals on Wheels. So that's a great cause as they deliver so many thousands of meals regularly around the eastern panhandle so do and, that monday and they do more than that uh they do deliver meals and wheels but they're also frequently go in and say a kind word and s sit down and speaks to speak to the individuals and i think that's probably more important than the hot meal or is equally important as a hot meal absolutely i, I would agree yeah. absolutely yeah. Now, here we have just the opposite. I bring a senior in three days a week to talk to me. Sometimes he brings me coconut cake dis yeah, uh, yeah. disguised as carrot cake. Sometimes he doesn't. It's all kind of up to him. Yeah, I, he brings me in to talk to him, but he doesn't listen to me, Mike. <laughs> I, I can see the, the glaze going over his eyes when I start telling one of my stories. Now, so. in your defense, some of that has to do with waking up at 20 after 3 every morning. <laughs> so exactly. It could be anybody. It could be a Vegas show right in but, front of me. I might glaze over. But when, when I start telling my story, Mike Height just is riveted with what I'm saying. And riveted. Thanks, yes. Mike. <laughs> riveted. I'm going to put you in the same category. <laughs> just got a text from Mike Rob. Hornby. He says, he, you have a riveter? He'd like to borrow it yeah. for his next project. <laughs> if you could bring that riveter over, he'd like to use it. You know, um, you between you guys, I'm going to reduce the number of words I'm prepared to use to very minimum. <laughs> so just... <laughs> you're good there. Yeah, you're good there. Hey, uh, let's talk about your interim session, Mike. How busy were your committees mike hornby said that his uh, were kind of hit and miss one was uh had some activity the other one dismissed in four minutes um mine were a little bit more busy I, what were your I, committee I, meetings? I, well i um i was a so you in interims you get assigned to some extra committee sometimes um one of the extra committees i'm on is called locker which is legislative oversight committee on health and human services um which didn't surprise me because i'm on health anyway so um but but this one's a little bit different uh that one it lasted i don't know probably two two and a half hours uh, a lot of what they discussed is there's a new pay system in in um dhhr and there were some snafus with it so they were they were talking a little bit about why there were snafus um because there were certain um, uh, agencies that weren't getting paid on time and weren't getting paid what they were supposed to get paid, and there was it was a big mess. So there there were people coming in and, and talking about those different things. Um, 
One of the other committees I'm on is finance. We talked a little bit about, um, you know, different financial stuff and, and back of the budget stuff. And we talk about back of the budget supplemental uh, monies that aren't in the actual budget. So we talked a little bit about that. Um, what else am I in? Uh, technology and infrastructure is another one I'm in. So I, I had that one and, and seniors and families, they both met at the same time. So I had sometimes you have to pick which committee you're going to go to. Um, I picked uh, technology and infrastructure because it's a major. Um, and in that one, we just went over a whole bunch of um, uh, of the bills that we we had had passed during the legislative session but didn't make it through the whole process um, and to see if there's something that we needed to tweak with those uh, particular bills uh, to get them through um, the next time or just you know resubmit them and and you know try to get it earlier in the I, if, if you the one thing i learned about bills is the earlier you can get them into the process the more likely they are to get passed so um some of those things that don't make it across the finish line you try to submit early in the in the process the next session and hope they get through which is why you see in the session as soon as the session begins there's all these bills that get introduced you know on day one Mike, going back to the DHHR, uh, has the division actually taken place now? Do we have the three three components? So, no, it hasn't. And uh, that's another one of the things we talked about um, during that. So they have until uh, January 1, 2024, to make that division. Um, they are in, in discussions and, and trying to work all that out and make sure that uh, when there is that division that it doesn't affect federal dollars and how they come in, um, you know, to, to make it as seamless as possible. Um, they do report back to us uh, during the interims, you know, on a monthly basis um, to how those things are going. Um, but it hasn't happened yet. When will they start the hiring process for the three directors, the three cabinet levels? You know, that's curious. I, uh, I don't know the answer to that, and uh, that wasn't one of the questions that was asked. Um, my guess is that that will be internal. I, I don't know that for sure, but there was some discussion about um, whether or not there would be any positions eliminated, um, and they don't think there will be any positions eliminated it's just how are you going to separate those things out somebody you may have had somebody a commissioner or something that, that had something to do with health or human resources yeah. both or human services both so you have to separate those out and make sure that they're just focused on the one now yeah a couple points on that if you consolidate you generally find uh, uh, positions eliminated if you if you divide rarely do you eliminate and most of the time you have to add uh, i come back to the point that's been raised several times the success of failure in my in my view is not so much on the structure as it will be on the leadership and who you get to uh, to head these three positions, and I guess two things: one, they're going getting the right person is probably going to require quite a bit of money, uh, and I hope the state's prepared to spend that money. The second thing, I would would hope they'd get them on board early enough so that as the division is taking place, that the three new directors will have some say so on how it's going to be formed. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed that. We haven't found a, a secretary of DHHR um, over the past year or so that we've had, excuse me, the, the interim uh, secretary Coben is just an interim secretary. And there's been, it seems to me like um, no, no effort to really hire a permanent. And I don't know if that's because the, they saw the, the separation coming, but I think Jeff, Jeff Coben, as secretary of DHHR, has done a good job. Um, he sort of came into the position, uh, you know, with without a whole lot of, of, of knowledge or, or um, advanced warning. Um, but he has worked with DHHR at the state level for a long, long time. So he sort of knew the inner workings of it. But I don't think he wants that position long term. I think he wants to be there to help out 
during the transition until they find yeah. somebody that can take over these positions. And when that's your your outlook, your attitude towards the position, you know, how well do you really do? You want to do things good, but, you know, are you – because this isn't going to be your long-term thing. Yeah, so, you have a short time as attitude. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I wish they would have gone ahead and really tried to find a, a permanent replacement for him since – it, his heart's not in it, if you will. Do you have any idea, uh, Mike, how, what the salary scale will be for these for the current position and the three new po- the the three positions in total? Um, I I don't. I'm I'm all the secretary level positions are pretty much the same. I, I mean, I, I don't know what they are. So actually, they're not very much money, considering everything. Not when you go to the corporate world, they're not very much. Oh money. no, when you so, compare to the corporate world, so, no. So no, you no. you take the job for prestige and influence and power more so than taking the job for uh, for monetary gains. Uh yes, I I would agree to that. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mike, I saw that David Elliott Pritt out of the 50th, which is Fayette County, switched parties. He left the Democratic Party, joined the Republican Party. So the margin that was 88-12 became 89-11. And then the 81st delegate district seat out of Monongalia County is vacant. That was a Democrat seat, and that is now vacant. Do you have any idea what happened there? Um, yeah, that one was, I'm pretty sure, it was Danielle Walker. Um, and, uh, she took a position took with a higher position. ACLU, I yeah. believe. Um, so that's why she resigned from that position. Uh, I don't know who they're going to appoint. I haven't heard a whole lot uh, about that. Um, did you know David Pritt much? Pritt? Yeah. I mean, we had, we had talked, um, a little bit back and forth, um, while we were down in session, he was obviously one of the most. Uh, moderate of the all the Democrats uh, down there. He didn't vote with them on a lot of different issues, um, and you could see that stood out. Um, and he seemed to have some squabbles back and forth with with the, the Democrats from time. He, I, I mean, I talked to him about a couple different issues, and he said he had he had gotten into some um, discussions. I'll say discussions with the the rest of the Democrats about certain issues that we were trying and one was the the uh, the gender surgery bill um and he he stated you know this is this is not um a a bill that i'm going to die on i'm i'm not going to you know go down with this particular bill so the, i know there were some discussions and some things back and forth why he decided to switch you know i really don't know was he um, a, was he a first term delegate or yes he, okay yes um, and I don't know the makeup of his district either. I don't know if that played into it at all. Um, but I will say he was a, he was a moderate Democrat, so it's not really surprising. So what was eighty eight to twelve is basically now eighty nine to ten until that's a tipping point. Eighty one. That's a tipping point. <laughs> That'll get some of those votes through now. But until Danielle Walker's replacement is appointed and brings it back to eighty nine to eleven, it, it, it's. It doesn't make a whole lot of difference numbers wise one way or the other, but it's it's an, another one that the Democrats lose mm-hmm. statewide. When you have a room of twelve, it's you can't afford to lose anybody. And I, I wonder uh, if there'll be any other switches, Mike, of the remaining Democrats that are there. Do you identify any of the others as moderate? Um, no, I don't see any of the other ones switching. Um, there are some that I would say are are not far left. Um, Actually, I would say probably at least half of them that are still over there aren't far left. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you you can have – this is the nice thing about when we went down there and learned a little bit about the Democrats. You go in and talk to them, and most of them are pretty open and, and, and honest and are willing to negotiate on some things and, and willing to listen. And, you know – you, you catch a little heat back here sometimes when you, you, you talk to Democrats, and I just don't understand that. Um, well, you have to be careful who you're photographed but, with. Uh, ab- absolutely. <laughs> but, Rob, going back to this point about sw- uh, sw- switching parties, uh, switching parties yeah. thank you. Uh, there's probably there's another reason as well. If you want to have a substantive voice, you might as well be on the Republican side because you're not going to have any real meaningful voice on the Democratic side. 
Uh, you can to, on the edges. To, you can do on the, the soft issues. But the, the heavy issues, it's all going to be dictated by the Republicans. On, on the heavy issues, and, you, and you're right. If, if you want to get a bill passed and it has some, uh, you know, as a Democrat, it would be hard to, to be the lead sponsor on the bill. There are some exceptions. The, the, the marriage bill. Um, that was that was uh, Delegate Young, who's a Democrat, and that was her. She was lead sponsor on that. She was the one pushing to to get that age um, up to eighteen, and um, that that bill moved pretty good. I mean, we know what the outcome is. I wasn't totally on board with it, but um, she did a great job uh, getting that bill passed and had a lot of uh, uh, Republican support. You can always pull out one or two examples sure. to make your point but i think in in general uh the the democrats have lost a voice have lost their voice well yes much like the the republicans didn't have a voice yeah. some time ago down exactly, there yeah. and yeah. and they become um to a degree obstructionist some of the republicans were the same way when when their numbers were, were dwindled down to nothing that they the tactic becomes um, what amendment can we propose to a bill to to kill it or to to soften it or, or whatever? That sort of becomes the the tactic at that point, um, which is unfortunate. But th- that's that's what's going on down there now for the most part on that side. But my point was the reason I started this mm-hmm. is uh, you can make you can give several reasons why someone wishes to shift parties, and some of it can be on ideological grounds. They they've had an awakening; they feel they're more comfortable with the other party. But I think a a big reason would be if you're if you want to get some bills through, be on the side of the of the the party that's going to make things happen uh, you're you're 100 yeah. percent right if you want to be an effective legislator and get something accomplished for your constituents yeah. um you you have to be on on the dominant side especially when it's this this dominant yeah. when it's you know it's 90 10 89 11 the only way you're really going to get uh meaningful legislative legislation passed is is to be on the dominant okay. side I was thinking, uh, Mike Hornby said you're on corrections as well. No, you're not. No, I, I, he did put the tour together of the ERJ, though. I, okay, I did yeah. do that, and during the interims, I went to the the jails and prison prisons committee just to get a sense of of what what's going on with the the corrections uh, issue. Um, there was a presentation in that particular committee. Uh, it wasn't my committee, and it's one you know, as even as a delegate, you sit in the audience with everybody else. But I, I wanted to get a feel. I wanted to hear the the presentation. Um, about what's going on, uh, I, I really think that's going to be a, an issue um, this off season and during the interims. Uh, I even think there may be a special session coming up this summer uh, to try to address that. We we are under a state of emergency for that particular issue. So, it been since last August. yes, absolutely. So, um, and, and it was one of the issues I was going to discuss today. We don't have to, but it it is an issue, and we we have to do something uh about that you can't have you know a state of emergency go on forever um sooner or later you have to do something about it and we have the ability to do something about it and uh something needs to be done yeah uh there's been cracks in that foundation for a long time uh and I was not. I worked with the uh, uh, correction squad a bit, the local regional jail, when I was county commissioner. And I was struck by the fact that every time I went over to talk to them, there was a new administrator. I was not involved so much with the turnover or the vacancies in the ranks, but I was always struck with the turnover, the rapid turnover of the administrator or the individual in charge. It's hard to keep a coherent program going with that much turnover. I would agree, and it's the 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 camaraderie over there, the 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 level of of it's just it's not just the administration either. It's it's the correction officers themselves when when they get to the point where they don't see a future in what they're doing. Um, 
and they see the constant turnover, then they get the attitude they don't want to be there either. So you, then you start getting a, a turnover in corrections, um, and now dwindled down to the, the point where it's. At, I mean, there's almost a seventy percent vacancy yeah. in corrections officers at at ERJ. Yeah. Now it's not that bad across the state. It's pretty bad across the state. It's 40, 50 percent across the state. But at ERJ here in Berkeley County, it's close to seventy percent. And, and you just can't sustain a prison system um, at 70 percent And vacancy. What, what role is the National Guard or the Air Guard playing? Well, that was another interesting thing when we went over there and, and we did the tour um, that the administrators and uh, were telling us over there that there's only so much that uh, the, the Guard personnel can do. Um, and everything they do is sort of like uh, – behind the glass if you will so they'll they'll be up in the towers and and they sort of monitor they'll be be behind the glass they're the ones that are opening doors and allowing people to come in and closing doors and that kind of stuff um out front as people the visitors come in and, and organizing that kind of thing but they have no interaction with the actual uh, um detainees at all because they they can't they're not trained in that regard yeah. so there's only a, a certain number of of jobs they can do there and one of the things that, that they told us was you could give me 50 more guardsmen and it wouldn't help me because yeah. there's only so many things they can do and that carries us back to the 70 percent vacancy and if the guard or guards are limited what they can do that means there's a tremendous amount of overtime that is being absolutely paid. and with a lot of overtime you have burnout very quickly well yes you have burnout and and you have when you have limited personnel that can have interaction um, with the prisoners then the the level of danger goes up and and their attitude what they were telling us while we were over there is you know we want we want our officers to come in and work their shift and it, our goal right now is that they go home safe and alive that's what our goal is it it's not you know and and that shouldn't be their their that should be their ultimate goal but that's not sh what they should be looking for on a daily basis they they need to have enough people in place that they're not fearful um that that the detainees could take over any time because they're outnumbered this the training for a guard the psychological training i hearken back to a study that was done in stanford several years ago back in the 60s i think they, they took a class and divided them into two categories one category were prison guards the other one were, were the inmates and they after a couple so days they had to break the exercise off because the prison guards were coming way too aggressive I would think would have the same problem here of having individuals that are not well trained that are not psychologically vetted they could go in and actually do more damage than they than they of good they were doing uh, uh, agreed um, you know and there's a couple different reasons for that obviously when when you're you have a 70 percent vacancy you're hiring just about anybody you yeah. can get just to fill slots um so that's one of the things and then you have to send them for training and the training's thousands of dollars and then they have to come back and hopefully you know that you have a, a a decent officer at that point but when it comes to the aggression you know sometimes i look at that aggression comes out of fear their fear um of what could happen and they get overly aggressive to to combat their own fear they're scared to death that they know that the inmates outnumber them and if they don't keep yeah. them in line and I, you're right yeah. i think they go too far sometimes yeah. and, in, in certain cases and you, and you may well be right uh, mike and that's something that should not be discounted but there's another element as well that was done in the stanford study that i referred to fear was not a play it was just the role that they played and then in a very short short time they started live in that role mm -hmm. and they uh, uh they emphasize the uh the power base that power. Had, yeah. mm -hmm. 